Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh meeting. Uh, if you have not done so, please add yourself to the participants list. So uh, before we get started, do you, uh, does anyone have any agenda items they would like added to the agenda? Uh, I guess we are all, I mean, at least I am adding something in the end. Uh, I saw something here, I don't know, uh, uh, Ramki, if this was you, which says distributed clouds use case, NSM workflow, deep dive. Is this a leftover from the previous times or is it something new we wanted to discuss? Ramki? Okay. Maybe he's um yeah, uh, premier. Uh, so I think uh, um I believe what Ramki wanted to give us basically there was a, a document that was uh, created uh, with all cleanup done on the use case. Um, so that's where I think uh, he wanted to have a quick review on some of the use cases and uh, uh, overview about the document. Okay, so let's let's make sure it's added to the uh, to the agenda as well. Just waiting for my um, for my Google Docs to actually start working. It's uh, having a little bit of trouble. Is anyone able to share the agenda as well? Yeah, I'll be This is Taylor. I can share it. Great, thanks, Taylor. Right. I'm doing it now. Yeah. Hi, Ronke. Shared. Cool. Oh, thanks. Okay, so. <clears throat> So we have um, some events coming up. So first, we have some recurring meetings. So besides this particular group, we have the NSM documentation, which is uh, every Wednesday at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time. And on Friday, we also have a use case uh, uh, call for, uh, uh, on also at 8 a.m. We also encourage people to go to the CNCF test bed, uh, which is every first and third Monday, if you're able to make it. Um, so NSM, uh, and NSM definitely has a good role to, uh, to play there. So events coming up, we have service mesh day uh, that, um, that is coming up in March 28th through 29th. So I have a talk that was accepted. So I need to finish up the last couple things to fully accept the talk. Uh, we have on April 2nd, we also have another talk coming up, which is the Intel out of the box uh, in Santa Clara. So this is at, uh, at Intel's uh, site. And so I'll be talking about what network service mesh is and, uh, and what's, uh, and also I, I'm organizing to see if I can get them to give me what's called a, basically a workshop. So Prem, Prem will be very familiar with this. Uh, the idea basically is that people would get some hands-on experience with network service mesh over a period of, I think, two to three hours. We have ONS coming up on April 3rd or 5th, and we have a few talks that uh, we encourage you to to uh, to attend and uh, and to help uh, get the word out. Uh, 
we have MPLS SDN NFV, uh, which I don't think we have any talks to, but it's worth going just to hearing what people have to say if you're if you happen to be in Paris. Container World on April 17th through 19th with a talk accepted by Prem. I uh, KubeCon EU. So uh, Nikolai mentioned a couple of the talks were rejected. I'm still waiting to hear from some of the others. So we'll we'll know for sure what's uh, going on with that soon. We have we do have a co-located event at KubeCon EU. So the co-located event, we uh, we can definitely get some uh, network service mesh talks there since we're using Fido in an interesting way. Uh, we also have KubeCon in China in Shanghai for. Um, I don't believe anyone submitted any talks there. Um, and we have, we finally have ONS uh, in Europe, and which is going to be Antwerp. I, the call for paper is currently open and closes in June 16th. So uh, if you would like to give a talk at ONS Europe, um, definitely let us know and we can, we can help organ, we can help um, craft a, uh, craft a compelling talk. Uh, finally, we have MEF 2019 in November 18th, and we have KubeCon uh, North America in San Diego. Both of those are the same time, so we'll have to we'll have to work that out. Um, finally, uh, we have the CNCF talk application. So if you haven't reviewed the talk application, we are going to eventually submit. Uh, the link is in the the link is in the chat. Um, we so with that, let's go ahead and get into some of the uh, into the main items. So we have a kind cluster provider provider demo by uh, by Nikolai. So uh, Nikolai, you have the floor. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can I can I take over just to share my screen and to show some things? Okay. Let me see what I. Uh, okay, apparently my Zoom crashed. Let's see if I share like this. Do you see my screen? It's just starting. Yeah, I'm able to see it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, <clears throat> uh, the last couple of days, uh, we have uh, integrated uh, a thing called Kind. Um, so it's essentially a Kubernetes uh, um, quick uh, deployment uh, tool uh, which uses uh, Docker images. Um, this is the home page of the project. Uh, and um, it essentially is a faster way. So this is essentially not for production. This is just for you know development purposes. Um, so uh, currently, uh, our main way to deploy um, and to de develop um, is to use uh, Vagrant virtual machines. Uh, we are able to bring, I mean, depending on your hardware specs of the of, the, of your computer, you are able to um, uh, to spawn two virtual machines. I mean, this is what we have uh, as the de default. Uh, and then uh, one is the master, the other is a worker, uh, and then you deploy loads across them. Uh, with the current uh, uh, deployment that we have with Kind, uh, we are getting, um, uh, let's just do time here. Uh, we are getting uh, three uh, nodes, to, uh, like one master and two, two worker nodes. Uh, and uh, what I want to show you is how quickly, so uh, uh, of course the very first time that you have to deploy because it's based on Docker, it essentially downloads and prepares an image. Uh, 
Uh, and once this image is prepared, so this essentially this kindest node V, of course, this is the version of the Kubernetes that it, uh, it has, um, that it deploys. Uh, so after that, it's just as quickly as what you're seeing now. Um, this is a kind of fast way to to do your de development. Of course, uh, we already found some limitations like mounting host volumes. Uh, we know that there might be some instabilities. Uh, fortunately, it turns out we have, we kind of um, know some, some people that are related to the development of kind. So uh, I guess that, that uh, it will be a good, um, so, okay, as you see, it's just like a minute and something. Uh, then essentially you have to do this. We have a um, no. This is the, just the cluster info. Cluster info. Um, you can get notes and see. Mm, and see that you have. Uh, the three nodes, they're still not ready. Uh, but uh, um, essentially the idea is that, that this this makes it more uh, accessible for people to develop, to try it without, uh, you know, all the complex setup that we have uh, up till now. Uh, you have to download uh, VirtualBox. Uh, if you are on Linux, uh, you have to use KVM if you want to. So all the different things that we have in our quick start guides. Uh, I think that that it's much uh, much easier to do it this way, just depending on Docker and then uh, relying on kind to do uh, what is there. Uh, it's true that kind is still kind of alpha version, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing that that uh, actually uh, I mean it's still not. Um, um, you can do infra de deploy. Uh, deploy all the images, uh, but uh, the other thing that that uh, we were trying uh, and uh, trying to evaluate is if we uh, if we 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 can use this uh, as in part of as a part of our um, continuous integration. So today our uh, we use Circle CI as a way to build images, and then all these images are pushed to Docker Hub, and then from Docker Hub they are uh, downloaded in packet where we spawn physical machines and then we have two nodes uh, kind of creating a similar situation as what we have with Vagrant. Um, but um, we, are, we are trying to evaluate how, how this project can help us in speeding up uh, our CI. Uh, so today we have like, um, I think a little bit less than 20 minutes, maybe 15, 16, I don't know. Uh, but we want to improve our testing, like add more test scenarios. And uh, if we find a faster way to spin up the cluster, uh, quickly run tests and then spin down, then um, then this could help overall the project. Um, so that's it. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has any questions or wants to see something else. Uh, um, so I'd like to point out that um, Nikolai is using uh, OSX, and so this works in an yes. OSX environment, and it should work in a uh, Linux environment without any issues. Yeah, maybe it's slightly better there because you don't have an addition, the additional virtual machine to run the Docker. <laughs> yeah, I find the uh, I find the uh, the power usage of running another VM uh, slightly annoying, uh, but acceptable. Yeah. But um, yeah, I find in in that scenario, uh, this this is compatible with with OSX, and we do have people who are well. At the start, we have Nikolai and uh, myself who who will be using in the OSX environment. So if you're, uh, it would be interesting to see how this works in uh, in Windows as, as well. Like there are some problems, there are some problems with uh, make files and so on. Uh, within uh, within Windows and how and how uh, how it all works together, but it's but it's I think it'd be a good place to start if someone if someone is uh, is really wanting to get a Windows environment up. This would be a really good place to to initiate that. Um, 
what, what does it? I'm just uh, I'm just suggesting that if they want to get Windows that they they it's running, they can they can also start with using Kind there as well because they can install Docker without any issues, and yeah. uh, so that'd be a, a good uh, a good starting place. Um, great. Is there any questions about this particular environment? Uh, Nikolai, could you please uh, tag in the uh, the link to that the Kind cluster? So uh, that's what I was uh, showing. So in 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 our master branch, you can find the guide oh, cool. uh, where actually it it explains uh, all these arguments, what you have to do, uh, and of course we are on on IRC. If if you have questions, uh, you can file issues also on GitHub. So cool. okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So we also have uh, Ramke and Prem who are going to talk about a distributed cloud use case for uh, uh, for enterprise and telco with an NSM workflow deep dive. So um, I'll let you both decide who's going to talk. Yep, I can. Uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. I will uh, share my screen. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, Ramki. Okay, excellent. So, um, one of the things Prem and I did as part of this exercise was sort of um, not just come up with these use cases, but also sort of look at the um, other use cases which have been put together, the old use case document, and then almost uh, say there's a cleanup version. So, for example, um, we are seeing one more use case coming together from John, if there is potential interest to carry that forward, that's from Paul Orcho. Um, so, and also essentially uh, clarifying the fact that there are uh, several protocols into consideration, but it's not a use case. For example, segment routing, uh, it's kind of a protocol to, uh, you know, to realize these use cases, right? Some of those uh, clarifications also we added. Um, so with that said, essentially um, we have spent some time on the use cases themselves last couple of calls. We'd quickly like to get to next level of detail. The only change from last time was um, when we discussed was additionally there is an internet breakout as you can see. So basically we talked about uh, enterprise uh, corporate, corporate access last time, right? Traffic coming, hitting the PE uh, and then going to um, your P gateway or S gateway in 4G terms for uh, you know, mobile processing, session processing, and then uh, heading to um, enterprise. So the other path is like, essentially you directly back out the internet, right? From the, after you, uh, you know, go through your mobile session processing, you don't head to the enterprise, but you go to the internet, but at that point you hit a DPA engine. The DPA is primarily for reverse traffic, but you know, to keep it symmetric, you pass both directions of the traffic. So basically, you'll have a fork uh, right at the, uh, you know, after you do the P gateway, escape, it gets gateway processing, whether you choose to go to internet or choose to go to uh, directly to the uh, enterprise private cloud. So um, essentially to summarize, uh, what would happen is, um, we'll talk about some of the details, but from an NSM connectivity role, um, when there is, in short summary, when there is no, SRAOV or SmartNIC or any sort of hardware acceleration, there is an additioning, additional tunneling needed. But if you're using hardware acceleration, notably SRAOV or SmartNIC, essentially you can just leverage the existing tunneling mechanism because for example, GTPU is a UDP tunnel on top of customer packets. Same goes with IPsec or L2TP, right? So, then on the SD WAN use case, uh, so Prem, do you want to talk a little more on little on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is uh, becoming more common the SD WAN use case, particularly with edge picking up. Um, wherein um, the main uh, uh, scenario here is uh, 
uh, you have a core uh, cloud, uh, which is which can be in uh, enterprise case, which can be a um, main data center, um, and then you have uh, edge cloud, uh, which are closer to that of the uh, um, customer premises um, where you are providing services. Uh, there are a bunch of use cases wherein it becomes very important. Um, so in that case, uh, the scenario what we are talking about here is uh, uh, what what would uh, uh, how would NSM play a, a role in building the infrastructure as well as um, helping out uh, uh, the apps to seamlessly access the uh, uh, resources, uh, both in edge cloud as well as on the uh, IT cloud. Um, so that's uh, uh, about the um, uh, SD-WAN scenario. Uh, and also I have just uh, uh, put the link where uh, there is also in the uh, ONAC, there is a specific article about how Kubernetes and SD-WAN plays a role. Uh, for example, uh, you have scenarios wherein within a, a metropolitan uh, uh, area network, a man network, you would essentially have uh, the Kubernetes master uh, um, sitting on the IT cloud and you would have the cluster formed across this edge cloud. Um, and uh, another important thing is the edge cloud has to be uh, really efficient in terms of its uh, footprint, uh, be it hardware or software. And also in certain scenarios, this edge cloud would essentially be uh, um, uh, instantiated uh, um, uh, and then it can it uh, instantiated based on the requirement and also uh, brought down once the requirement is met. Um, so, so this is primarily uh, where and how would you uh, play out edge cloud using uh, Kubernetes uh, NSM. Yeah. So uh, before jumping into the connectivity walkthrough, Sort of, uh, you know how NSM plays a role. I do want to point out. Uh, I just sent an email from uh, right from the Kubernetes scaling group. So essentially, in a distributed scenario, cloud scenario, how will Kubernetes work? So essentially, uh, a, poten a potential deployment model could be going beyond a actual physical data center where basically latency is the order of microseconds. To you can take it to milliseconds. Basically, uh, the case there is you know, like an enterprise SD WAN or the telco distributed cloud where a hub site, which could cover several small uh, edge sites, like as an example, an enterprise example is the branch office, right? Probably you just have one server there. You can cover, you don't need to install a Kubernetes master there, but as long as the hub site is within a few milliseconds away, latency away, you're good. Uh, and officially confirmed by the um, Kubernetes six scale group. With that, um, or essentially the millisecond, you can call it metro distance, right? Within a metro, it should be fine, but definitely not over van, right? But also the key point is you don't need to have a Kubernetes cluster in each and every location. Like if you just have a single server, it's not necessary to just dump a Kubernetes cluster there. With that, um, so going to the connectivity walkthrough. So essentially there are three layers, right? So coming from inside out, right? So the first is of course the tenant or the customer payload, right? So basically there you have the tenant customer overlay or the IP header overlay L3 or the um, IP header or overlay L2 or the Mac header, right? So this is tenant or customer information. This is true for all cases. And again, the next level of tunneling for all cases. So for example, we saw, um, you know, IPsec being used in both uh, in the distributed telco cloud use case or in the SD-WAN use case. And segment routing, of course, the tunneling mechanism, uh, which is popular more in the telco world. But it's uh, very much possible in the enterprise SD-WAN because it's typically multi-path. You have the packets through the internet using IPsec, but then uh, some critical traffic would go over the MPLS network. At that point, you'd be using segment routing. And at that point, the tunneling could use other MPLS or IP tunneling mechanisms. But the key to note here is, this is essentially you're talking underlay here. And in this case, all these packets are all routed, right? I mean, um, so basically the fundamental mechanism, it's all routing at this underlay level, right? And L2 header is basically providing the MAC header, but the packets are still routed. You, at each routing hop, you look up the MAC address and you take action on it. So now as you peel down the layers, um, in if there is SRIOV or smart NIC, so essentially what happens is 
at that point you can you have the mac address to uh, process either it could be the global mac address it could be processing directly or if you want to deal with private mac addresses then the you need to bring in the outer uh, wheel uh, underlay or outer vlan tag also into the equation right to model uh, but what gets interesting is uh, if in the absence of uh, sro in smart nic so what happens is from a host perspective you have only one mac address exposed right typically one or a few right so then that's when you go with a tunneling example this is vxlan right um it's a typical one i mean it could be vxlan etc as a right term it could be chenev or something else or so the the rational for here essentially what you're doing is you're still routing with respect to uh, you know the uh, underlay but you are able to con convey the entire l2 payload i mean this whole payload everything you know uh including the gre or ipsec tunnel is a payload for it right is you are able to convey it to your uh, pod of interest or kubernetes managing vm vm of interest and this is kind of nicely depicted in this workflow here right how this is flowing through from nsc1 to nsc2 where essentially we are depicting through uh essentially there are two interfaces and this example is also catering at a multi tenancy if there is a, a single tenant then you would just need one additional interface i1 i2 besides uh, kubernetes interface but in the case of multi tenancy and if you want superior isolation this is a typical de deployment model and with that background so essentially what we said was uh, let's go into now what the current nsm scope looks like and what we need to do and um, thanks frederick for the great discussion i think we we did uh, talk about a lot of a lot of this last friday but we will uh, double click more on this sure. before we before we go on um is is it possible to share the uh the document or or did i did i miss it so that other people in their own time can can also review it? oh yeah um this one is also thanks to nikolay is also published actually this document Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we. I'm gonna put this. So I think if you click into um, the use case calendar, it will have the meeting notes and this document. Okay, great. So uh, the current NSM scope supports. Um, I mean, again, to be very specific, one endpoint per NSM, the network service description, right? Only from a description perspective, uh, but then uh, and of course it supports uh, software and hardware accelerated CNI from interconnection. It's like very flexible, right? Uh, working with the device plugins and then automate uh, the end-to-end all -end, uh, non-KATS point endpoints also like the ENSM, right? Um, so so now if you the enhanced NSM scope you're looking at a sort of a uh we definitely need from a multi tenancy use case perspective support multiple uh, endpoints for nsc in the network service description so the uh, the in um, in basically if you go externally we call it nsd network service descriptor so basically from that perspective right uh, for multi tenancy we definitely need to support uh, multiple endpoints if you go to long i mean from a long term this is actually really looking at implementing a full blown ha policy and there are different types of policies but the thought process is for a simple i mean first step this is actually could be one of the ha policies where uh, typically if there is a fault in in the pair scenario if there is a fault in an endpoint pair typically it's an indicator for bigger problem because you will be hitting essentially the you know both the endpoints no matter what even if they're going to different network functions will be hitting the same host uh, perhaps the same i mean the nick or the um, um or the soft switch we switch right so basically one ha policy could be simple in this case we just kill the entire network function and recreate the pod right as so this is a suggested first step but essentially this is coming to implementing full blown ha policies and uh, daniel others who are experts in segment routing know this more than me so basically it's pretty elaborate how you want to fail over and take a uh, different path right you know routing path etc right 
So the next one is essentially, again, the use case is multi-tenancy, but this is getting into uh, another detail, right? So basically, um, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, uh, say uh, the case where, uh, how you manage the two cases, right? So one is the uh, SRIOV or SmartNIC case, where how do you manage the MAC address, right? Um, so basically, it could be a global MAC address or outer MAC address, and uh, you know, which is which could be private, and then a VLAN. Um, but also, the more uh, important one is um, essentially, uh, I think, yeah, we have to capture the detail here. So uh, the uh, support endpoint pair grouping for interconnect policy. So let me explain a little more. So let's say we. Uh, went to the domain where uh, essentially there is no SRIV or SmartNIC, which is a very popular case. For example, you're using VPP or OVS or, you know, um, VMware vSwitcher, and there's so many vSwitches, right? So basically, what happens at that point, um, you have to critically look at how you manage the ID space. Um, one simple way is say, I mean, if you're looking at VXLAN, one simple way would be go back and say, hey, all these interconnects. I mean, you basically have a network service description which in, which has several uh, network functions, and you can say, hey, all of them belong to the same BNI. Right? Basically, there are point-to-point -point connections, but you make that simplifying assumption, same BNI, and then differentiate based from just the MAC address, right? So this is a scalable up approach versus you say, hey, well, um, I'm going to, I need fine-grained isolation, like each of the interconnect paths are, need to be completely isolated and then start using BNIs then, uh, so basically you could face scalability issues, right, in your deployment. So some things to, that is an important thing to keep in mind. So that's sort of the notion of the endpoint pair grouping for interconnect policy, right? So, um, <clears throat> Uh, so basically, we need to have this policies, but we can start small saying, you know, uh, one simple policy could be, hey, uh, it's just either, I mean, two or two policies. One is full isolation or no isolation. Keep it simple. But then we can start going into more fine-grained policies as we make progress. Um, and also do want to stress the point, all these standard tunneling points, uh, mechanisms uh, which you're using or the more popular ones are always routed from an underlay perspective, right? Basically, each hop is a router. That's how uh, these, I mean, the popular tunneling protocols are. Um, and um, essentially, the next one is around traffic management. So basically, uh, based on uh, the interconnect policies and also the multi-tenancy, you, uh, you basically support uh, interconnect usage monitoring. Um, it could be construed independent of the previous one also, no matter multi-tenancy or not, we need to uh, look at uh, interconnected usage monitoring, right, and figure out uh, what is going on uh, from an interconnect perspective. You know, packets in and out, and then you can take it to, and uh, this could be, for example, useful for figuring out if there is some sort of uh, DDoS attack happening, right, and then um, take further action. Um, and uh, this is to second, the next one is more of a repeat saying this should be done for both software and hardware activated CNIs, uh, not for one or the other, right? The same interconnect usage monitoring. And the last one is essentially support bandwidth management, right? This is a, again, a very interesting and critical one. So the use case is QoS. So if you look at the, uh, you know, on the compute side, uh, k has supports elaborate uh, policies. For example, uh, you know, quality of service, there are three levels um, from a uh, compute perspective. There is CPU and memory. We call it best effort uh, or guaranteed or a min guarantee model, right? Uh, or best effort, min guarantee, or absolute guarantee, right? Uh, and in our case, uh, this would also entail k scheduler changes if you want to go that route, but we could construe, construe that a long-term activity. But as a first step, at least, uh, you know, build in the enforcement, which can happen right at our layer itself to so the CNI, enforce it in either you're using the um, uh, software, software path or the hardware activated CNI. Right? 
this is sort of, I went through a little fast and now uh, completely open to questions and a deeper dive. Um, so I had one, you sort of waved past segment routing and VXLAN are kinds of overlay, that's fine, it's all good. But there's a problem there, I think, of uh, who's authorized to use which kind of overlay. If you were doing uh, the enterprise use case that you suggested and used SR, then that simply wouldn't fly because um, there's somebody in the middle between who's got to agree that SR is actually permissible and workable. So, um, I think if you, I, I mean, I'm guessing that one of your next steps here is to break this down to some sort of call sequence. I think when you do that, then you've got a, a cross administrative domain issue that will show up. Um, so you are talking about the segment routing use case? Well, I'm talking about using segment routing. Segment routing is a tool, it's not a use case. And to be fair, your point about quality of service is the same, I would argue. It's a tool, not a use case. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. So segment routing, yeah, segment routing tunneling mechanism. So um, I didn't fully, um, I mean, is it, it's still, so even if you're doing segment routing as a tunneling mechanism, it will still be, um, the packets will be routed, right? Correct. So, Over the, what, it, within the tunnel, the packets will appear to be routed, yes. Um, I, I'm not debating that. I'm more trying to work out how your, I mean, we're NSM here, so the question is how you set up the mesh. And so the question I'm asking myself is, is how I would set that mesh up with a sequence of calls to uh, NSM managers. And um, that's where this sort of loses its track. Yeah, I to add on to what uh, to what Ian is saying, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. So, like people, it's it's not that someone wants segment uh, segment routing; it's that they want some they want some feature or functionality that could render into uh, they could render into segment routing, and so part so part of uh, so part of what would be useful, I think, would be to try to work out. What is what is that high level use case that uh, that we can drive towards to say then segment routing can can help in this scenario uh, and make sure that that, uh, that that use case works as opposed to just saying we do we do segment routing. And could, yeah, could do. I mean, the the thing is that overlay it, it's not clearly a network service endpoint, but nevertheless that overlay is an important and significant part of the 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 mesh that you're setting up so you're asking for something specifically by property and i'm not quite sure how that request would happen and again particularly because this crosses an administrative boundary between an enterprise and a service provider that's quite an important question because the 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 call might result in asking the service provider for something rather than asking for segment routing by name yeah and um, that's um it's the same advice that uh <sighs> that I gave to the network service planning group on their inaugural meeting when they were talking about multiple interfaces. And it's like, okay, it's not, the thing that people want is not the multiple interface. It's actually, you have to look at why, do, why are they asking for that feature? It might be for a faster data plane or it might be for something that they can get more, uh, more predictable performance or quality of service on uh, in, in, in order to solve a very specific use case. Uh, and the actual quality of service mechanism or the fact that it rendered into another interface is, is not actually what, what the user was, was looking for. It was just a means to an end. So, uh, so we, should, we should try to work out what some of the more popular things are. Like why, why do people bring in SRVs uh, SRV, uh, or SRV6 as an example? And then ask the question like, you know, why, you know, what, what use case do we drive from, from that? So like basically like step up one level higher. So, um, so that's at least the thought process. Is, I mean, basically this is, uh, um, so there are two aspects to it, right? Of course, um, a protocol like SRV6 bring some additional value more, I would say with respect to, uh, the end-to-end -end service itself, sort of maybe you can argue QoS, correct? Uh, but uh, we also have to look at uh, look at what does it exactly mean from an NSM perspective. At least if you go back to 
uh, these architectural impacts, right? So basically the use cases, it would sort of then fall into the QoS aspect perhaps, right? Or the traffic management, more towards that. So basically segment routing, uh, if you're using segment routing, you can do some fine-grained QoS between these two endpoints. And then the way that will actually percolate to NSM is more of the QoS, right? Correct. Or even classic MPL, you can do bandwidth management, but it's sort of more of the implication rather than um, anything else is the thought process, right? Yeah, but uh, again, you, the, the problem at the moment is, is you've got use cases described quite well and implementations um, or, you know, components that you can use to implement those use cases. And NSM is the glue between the two, and I'm just not seeing the link here. So the, the, really it comes down to uh, effectively use cases, tools, and how NSM would assemble those tools to make the use case work. And, and I think that's what, uh, th this document's a little bit scattershot in that regard at the moment. It mixes all three together and it's not clear separation between them. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, and so the, the, uh, that aspect essentially we are, I think probably, um, are you looking at sort of, uh, so now once you have clarity and we have some idea of what we're going to do, I mean, we want to double click into sort of a workflow to make that, bring that clarity saying, hey, this is how it will look like, um, or anything else, because I think many of this is, it's probably, uh, clear and people who are extremely familiar with this in their mind, but sort sort of it's still uh, not reflecting the workflow, right? I mean, as Prem and um, I spent some well, time, we realized that. I, hey, I, I'm, I, I mean, to be fair, I'm pretty damn familiar with service provider networking and with the use cases that you're explaining. And yes, absolutely, I think that's exactly what you should do. You need to double click into what the calls would be to NSM to set this up and would be on failure as well because you sort of hand wave that one off slightly um, because that is precisely the detail we need to actually work out whether the current description of NSM actually applies to this use case or whether we're missing something and that's what we need to understand if we're missing if what we're doing isn't quite going to work then then you know examining a use case is precisely how we fix it yeah, yeah so I agree uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh... Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think a good way to, to start as well is if you if you scroll up to the image that you provided. So, so if we look at like this particular uh, scenario where we we're, we're actually ignore the fact that it's NSE or OVS or physical NIC and just imagine like the standard, you know, you have the some some client connecting to some set of services and you could build a chain out longer if you like. And the fact that there's two connections here, what you're trying to express is that uh, is that multi-tenancy. So if we start with that basic premise, and then we start asking the question like, how do we ensure isolation between uh, between the two customers? Uh, how do we how do we how do we ensure the user gets the throughput that they're looking for? How do we ensure the user gets the security they're they're looking for with with uh, with NSM? Uh, how do we ensure when a failure occurs? with a link or one of the services that they get rerouted. And so I think if, if we look at it, uh, each one piecemeal in that scenario uh, to start off with, then that, that would probably be a good way to start. And then what we can do is start to compose them saying, how do we get auto healing plus security plus, plus whatever, and start to drive to a, to a full end-to-end -end, uh, uh, use case. So I, I think that you're, you're starting off really well. Like you're asking the right set of questions. Uh, and the, the the feedback I think is that uh, is to focus primarily at the top level use case. Like, what is it that we want? You know, if we, if we had thirty seconds to to tell an executive uh, who is going to make a decision on this, what we provide them, you know, we saying things like, "Oh, we provide quality of service," and we provide, you know, th those things are important. But we have to be able to drive a uh, an effective narrative that helps lead people to see how how this solves it at a, at a holistic view. Yeah, I, I would argue, in fact, that NSM's job isn't to provide quality of service; it's to provide the ability to connect services together that give you things like quality of service as well. So exactly, it's just, um, and that's what I'm trying to understand from your document. You've reeled off a list of 
uh, and again, part of the problem with the document is it's a mix of two things together. One is high level use cases, which should have under them, you know, enabling features that will make them better. And one perhaps is low level features that you might use to enable those use cases. But the more important question, which is completely unanswered as yet, which is totally understandable, is how NSM enables you to use the features you're talking about to deliver the use cases that you're interested in. Uh, and that's what you've skipped over in there. It's just, you've mixed the two up and the, then the missing component just isn't obviously missing, I think. Yeah, like, I think, uh, yeah, those are all fair points, I agree with you, Ian. So what we have done is essentially, uh, we took a more of a top-down approach wherein first define the use cases, then uh, get into the details of what would be the requirement from an NSM perspective. And I agree, uh, as a next step, uh, what we can do is we can identify the components and then more like a call flow or a sequence diagram between them, which essentially uh, enumerates uh, the details on how things would uh, uh, would essentially look uh, in both the use cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I would and, just um, say pull pull your implementation bits out from from the use case mm -hmm. for the time being and stick it in a separate section so it's clear that this is the use case you have and these are the building blocks you've used to solve it. Um, and then, the, you know, the answer, the demonstration is how you glue the two things together. Yeah, I think it's a very, uh, very fair point, and I'll def we will probably definitely look into it. And uh, so, as an, um, uh, uh, just to uh, other aspect was like precisely uh, this in a sense we wanted to get some early feedback, the agile, um, and this, this particular step, what you felt was you probably need the experts such as Fred and Nikolai, right? I mean, to, who know the code inside out, right? Or Ed also, right, to that matter. So basically, they are the people who have been looking at the workflows. And you want to make sure first that we have at least some, um, you know, basically direction we are setting here with the distributed cloud. Uh, and as it looks like, I think there is good interest and in also basically alignment. And... Uh, this is more of saying first setting that stage for that. That's what we are thinking in mind rather than if you do everything and we find that, oh my God, these use cases themselves are busted, then it's a bigger problem we're facing, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's precisely it. I, I'm trying to make sure, and it, it's not about the fact that they know the code, it's about the fact they know what they're trying to do. Um, but yes, the, the point about your use case is it evaluates whether their current thinking is the right one or whether we need to change direction slightly. That's exactly what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, just so, to just to be clear, I think this is a fantastic start. Like literally, we've had what one or one or two meetings at the most, two meetings, and when we're already up to to having this information discussed and in a in a scenario that is uh, that is digestible. So so I, so I really want to make it clear, like we're off to a really great start. And so we so yeah, we just we want to make sure that it's that this thing is heading towards. Uh, Towards the direction to uh, to make it very very clear as to not only what is it what use case we're trying to solve, but also make it very clear like this is the part that like network service mesh provides, and then this is the part that you have to plug in, you know, with things like firewalls and so on. Like we're not going to provide a firewall for you, but uh, you can bring in your your favorite firewall uh, provided you can you can plug in or create your own endpoint for it. So. Uh, so in that scenario, like I think, uh, I think this is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic start. So uh, I'll definitely make sure my time is available to help uh, to to help you uh, work out uh, not only high level stuff but also uh, details as well. Excellent. Thank you, Fred. We'll count on you for the call flows <laughs> because yeah, we need basically you have a thorough understanding of what is there and you know how things are lining up yeah uh so uh Nikolai ramki, also. yeah i think yeah. ramki even before we get into the call flow right what i was thinking is at least zoom into uh, uh further details on uh how would a uh, how would a typical deployment look like right and then what we can do is uh, we can bring in call flow um so that's what i was thinking probably one level of uh, further uh, uh, getting into the details on, for example, uh, uh, be it an edge cloud or be it in the scenario, what would be the components, what would a service be and what will happen when a service gets deep, but uh, things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, and in fact, that step, we could even um, whiteboard it out if yeah. possible rather than, 
agree correct i mean basically and then um, uh, be agile and little bit faster like whiteboard and then of course uh, capture all those as pictures and then quickly progress to the call flow step because that's when when you bring to this audience then it'll be clear on who's doing what right, right. absolutely yeah yep. okay so before we finish up do we have any last uh, questions in this particular topic also uh, 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 we are uh, probably calling out for more people who can get in because definitely this is uh, uh, this team has a lot of experience and uh, probably whoever is interested can probably join and help us in defining the uh, details because once the rubber hits the road uh, then you would essentially have a lot of unknown or a lot of questions and uh, more the uh, team says better it is as well i have a standing uh, conflict with the friday call but i'm hoping to um eventually reschedule that um because I, I have a lot of questions on this um especially since it tries to like span both the service provider network and the enterprise network and the considerations for like what it actually means when an enterprise peers with a service provider directly like wants to become a bgp peer this and that like i, I think a lot of this stuff looks good on paper and i think that the technology is there to support it but that doesn't necessarily mean that the business processes or the way that service providers onboard customers necessarily is there to support it unless you're purely just going to ask for you know a bgp peer and then do tons of tunneling over everything or you know i i saw sd wan was in there but like i said that's even that still you, you could have nsm make all these calls to the sd wan but if it only controls the overlay then nothing actually happens on your underlay and so you say increase this to 500 megs and you still only have 100 meg line i mean there's lots and lots of considerations if you want to start playing in the service provider space that i think um there's just weird caveats that don't apply in the enterprise space that we'll have to account for. Another way of looking at it is you're almost trying to change the world by giving service providers an API. And that actually might be the right answer for what it's worth. But um, uh, Well, and that's what MEF has... is doing, right? So Sorry? I mean, like I said, well, and that's what we've been working on, like when I've been like working on like the MEF standards for APIs and stuff is like, if it, like Romkey, I recommend you Google after this, I'm just looking to the interlude API and the Sonata API and stuff. and at least, you know, my charter and a few others, we've been looking into the MEF space on doing exactly what Ian just described, where we present an API and if resources are available, you could potentially make requests for changes to the underlay. This is still in its early, early infancy, but um, it's something that at least in the ethernet space, like standards and, you know, um, uh, sorry, uh, data models and whatnot are starting to like, see their infancy. I mean, I worry that like anything in the service provider space, there'll be 15 different standards and then nobody will use them. But these are considerations. <laughs> um, and like NSM at that point, and this is where mine and Ed's definitions of data plane get a little wonky, because in this case, that interlude API for service, you know, modification to the underlay would essentially be your data plane as far as NSM is concerned. And you would make a request to the service provider to not only, you know, get that overlay change, which you would do to the SD-WAN platform, but then also make a request for the underlay change so that, you know, the MPLS configurations underpinning everything actually bump your circuit capacity up. Yeah, I, th I think Ed's view on it is, uh, is sort of like a, a certain phrase about turtles all the way down applies, you know, it's data planes all the way down. Um, right. But and if, yeah. if that's the model we're going with, that's fine. But in this case, like I said, I mean, the service provider itself is the data plane, right? I yeah. mean, you could make that argument because it's what's passing your packets for you and your frames. So I get it. It's just, it's a nebulous way for me to look at it as a service provider engineer. Um, but then at that point, yeah, like NSM would only be calling interlude or Sonata versus, you know, you're not going to go in and provision some service providers interface, right? Like on a switch somewhere like in a hub or at, underneath the cell tower, like zero chance that that ever happens. So um, if this API thing comes to fruition and MEF is successful, then that might be how a use case like this fully materializes from end to end. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think we can't absolve ourselves of this by saying it's all the data planes problem because in many regards, the data plane here is just another kind of service again, particularly when it's, it's cross one and it's got specific behavior. So, you know, we have to deal with the consequence of having services that people pr bring along that implement, you know, end to end connectivity. That, that's yeah, just and the I, nature of this. And I, I um, think the question is going to be what, what are you, do we, what things do we want to lift from the, from the data plane into, into NSM?
so we can so we can do the right kind of negotiation between uh, disparate things. So uh, that's that's going to be a very interesting question and may actually be different between certain uh, between certain types of data plans. So so we definitely have a lot of things to to look at in that space. Uh, but with that, yeah. we're we're actually out of out of time. So yeah, um, good point, uh, and also good point, and Mef uh, Jeffrey. So similarly. Probably uh, we should also be looking at if there is anything to leverage from HC, right? I mean, they have, uh, I'm not saying they've done a fantastic job on the network service descriptor, but that could also be leverageable. I mean, as, of, as we uh, walk through all this. Um, and uh, so one request to the team. So if you think, do you think that this Friday is a little, I mean, basically not, not the most convenient time, the Friday morning? I mean, I can't make it, but I don't. I'm I'm one person. The collective's more important, so I'll see if I can move some stuff around. But Fridays are at the moment a hard no for me. Yeah, my my recommendation is if we're worried about people not being able to show up, would be to run some form of a doodle poll and see if uh, if like Friday versus Thursday uh, works. But um, I, I I know that Ed has uh, has a conflict on Fridays, uh, so I, I'll definitely I, I can definitely show up to them. But yeah, you're right. I mean, we ran the doodle poll between Friday and Monday, and so um, we and we do want to keep the meetings to before 9 a.m. Pacific, right? Respecting. Yeah. Anyways, let's let's talk about this at a at a later time because we're we're starting to go. Okay, over excellent. The, yeah. The well, then. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Fred. So we'll um, we'll probably it'll be great if we can meet up and then make some offline progress, especially in the workflows. Sure, I'm happy to I'm happy to do that as well as long as we share back and discuss in the community. Um, okay. With with that, if there's. Um, if there's no other urgent uh, uh, news, then uh, thank you everyone for for your time, and we will see you all next week at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Bye bye. Bye. bye.